All right, hello, Fortinas brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 8th, 2024, and we're in like four days remaining in the countdown. We're, we're in that fourth day. It's so exciting. Here, let me see. What is the what is the countdown clock show? There we go. Three days, 15 hours, 22 minutes. Now, please take that with a grain of salt because I don't know exactly what time, even though the timing seems to be pretty darn precise um, in relation to sunset at 726 p.m. in Jerusalem. Uh, which will be the end of the seventh day uh, of the seventh week of the seven Sabbaths of the true Feast of Weeks. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, <laughs> if if we have understood, as I believe we prayerfully have, that has been so clearly revealed, I believe this is the final teaching of Ministry Revealed, at least in this format. The only thing that would be left after this is the Lord giving us our instructions, meeting with that remnant group, and then we'll be sent out. Um, so I believe in this format, this is it. I really believe this is it. And, um, you know, I want to say I, I love you all. I thank you. I'm grateful for each of you. I appreciate you. Whether you've been around since the beginning or if you just started yesterday or just came across this video today. God bless you, strengthen you, watch over you and yours always until, man, I'm so grateful to have, to have played a role in your lives that the, that the Lord has, had decided to use me to, to fill me with his spirit to, to reveal this incredible mystery that has been hidden in the layers of scripture since the beginning of creation. I, I, I'd never have taken it lightly. It's it's always been an honor. It's always been a blessing. There's <laughs> there's of course been ups and downs through it all, but my goodness, I as I've said before over the years, I wouldn't change this for all the money in the world. I could care less. All we want is come, Lord, come, and I cannot wait to see what that's going to be like in His presence, whether. We're accounted worthy to escape all these things and be in the lowest room of the third heaven in the Lord's presence forever, or whether he chooses some of us or all of us here to remain and to serve him as his John the Baptist Elijah types, that Moses Elijah type, whatever his will. I know there are many, many of you out there and a number of you who I've spoken to that are they're, they're regardless just want it to begin to know that we have truly understood it the revelation is all about to be revealed that he has prepared us and trained us up to finish the story that we can go out and serve him in the midst of not only chaos of tribulation of seals the first seven years but to bring in and to be part of bringing in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of that chaos so brothers and sisters with that i'm so grateful i love you all i thank you and i hope and pray as we have truly i believe understood we'll never see you in this format again or hear from me in this format prayerfully ever again but it will be face to face with the lord prayerfully in the lowest room of the third heaven as said or in his presence at the banquet meal, being trained up by him, ready to serve him as we dine together with him after the wedding. So, with that, brothers and sisters, I thought tonight's title was just perfect. We are the 14ers. And for those of you who have been around for a while, you'll kind of know from that title a little bit of where we're going. Or, or how it's going to open and what we're going to be going into. And the reason this came about was because of our uh, one of our brothers, Brian. It was like an old post, so I didn't. It was a post from about a year or so ago, and and the fitting revelation of this last teaching. This last teaching was no joke. It was it was something to 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 understand. It was something to comprehend. It was something to wrap our minds around 
at what is going to be seen to at least get an idea, a, a concept in our mind so that when the time comes, we won't be at a loss. We won't be freaking out. When if, if it's something that the Lord reveals to us at the meal, at the banquet meal for his remnant Elijah's that are going to be serving, we won't be surprised. We won't be caught off guard by it because it was freaky. It was wild to see this. It doesn't mean that the, the, the quote unquote testimonies, it doesn't mean somebody has to believe all the, the, the testimonies that were shared of these people from back in the day. The revelation of it was what scripture and the Apocrypha cleared up for us in the understanding that it's here and will be coming from there when it's time to be seen. That when enough people are crying out for the Lord, that when this great revival has happened and they have to flee into the wilderness and into the mountains, when, when the beast gets his authority to continue for 42 months, and that's when the mark comes, and that's when all the fleeing and, and the chaos and, the, and, and what comes about against them. And when the, the crying out is so great by the end of the sixth year of seals, that mountain will move. That mountain that will move at the crying out of all believers at that time is the mountain of the Lord. And the revelation of it is so fitting in relation to the revelation of the name of this ministry, the 14ers. Ministry revealed, but it we call ourselves the 14ers. Now, when I called us, when I called us the 14ers, I didn't do it because I knew anything about 14ers of anything. I simply did it because the revelation of the end of days is not seven years, as you all know, but 14 years. It is not maybe, it is not kind of, it is not possibly, it is absolutely biblical revealed truth from the beginning of creation to the end of it all. It's all true. Only later did people share with me other things that, are, that have taken place in relation to people being called 14ers even now and in history. And that's what our brother Brian had shared uh, as this reminder or the post came back again about this reminder of 14ers. And we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about some of these things because it's just so exciting. And, and from there, you're not going to be hearing anything new. I don't have something new for you here today. In this final teaching, it's, it's a preparation. It's a reminder of a remnant group being prepared. That we have understood it. That it's true. It's, it's so clear. It's undeniable. And it's, it's a group of people who have fittingly been called unknowingly ahead of time 14ers. When when you see and understand this, especially if you're newer, this is gonna this is gonna blow your mind. It's gonna kind of freak you out a bit. For those of you that have been around for a little bit, you've heard this, you've seen this. Well, this is just tying it all in together for this remnant group that is going to be remaining in the Lord's will to serve Him in this season that's coming. And so that's what we're gonna get we're gonna get into what we're gonna start with, and you're gonna see why this last one about the coming of Mount Zion when he comes with paradise at the end of the sixth year of seals and why that revelation so late in the game and what you can call the real final teaching why it was so important why I believed it was it was just something necessary so wild but necessary for us to comprehend before it all began so with that you know what I'm going to do as I usually do because there's always new people that are listening. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by coming to this playlist series right here. This playlist series called the Intro to the End Times Revelation or the Revealed End Times Study Note series is where we recommend everybody start. Even if you're watching this now and you're saying, but there's only a few days. Just watch the first four videos 
and you will begin to be prepared in the revelation of everything that's been shared here over the last seven years. Start the first four videos. The first one is a 22 minute introduction, little tidbits of what you're gonna see in the three that follow it. The, <clears throat> the second one is a 30 minute Bible study of the revelation of the differences in the gospels and who they're speaking to. Those mysteries, those differences in the gospels are all prophetic and we have revealed dozens upon dozens of them here over the past seven years, proving their prophetic depth within the gospels. That Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, in the end is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The first will be last, the last will be first. It's, it's incredible. It reveals pre, mid, and post once you understand their differences. It's not maybe. It's not kind of. I don't care if somebody comes to me and says, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Believe me, I've had that happen more than once or twice. I can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt with absolute unequivocal certainty that it's true. And it reveals the understanding as to why everybody can argue their stance on whether pre, mid, or post is true. Because everyone can do it from their position on gospels that they've understood or on the scriptures that they've understood. The answer is because they're all true. And when you understand it, and when you understand those differences, then when you get to the third video, another 30-minute intro. That's all it is. A 30-minute intro to the revelation that then follows when you realize who Mark and Luke are speaking to, you then realize that the end of days is not seven years long, but 14 years long. And before it begins, there's a period called above, which is 50 days. And that 50 days begins with the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ that is expected on some point, depending where you live on the, in the world, begins August 12th. And the 50 days will begin. And at the end of 50 days, the 14 years will begin on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets of 2024. Then when you get through those three, only 22 minutes, 30 minutes, and 30 minutes, by the time you get to the fourth one, now you're going to spend a little time. But it's worth it because you're going to understand how this was all missed. It's called It's All Because of Matthew. It's about two hours and 45 minutes, and it is going to blow your mind after you've started to grasp the other teachings that came before it. You're going to realize that the reason it hadn't been understood is one, because it wasn't yet the Lord's timing. It was to be made known in the final generation. And two, it's because everybody for hundreds of years has been and is foundationally taught from the Gospel of Matthew. So unbeknownst to them, having learned everything from the Gospel of Matthew, all they see is the seven years to Judah. Because they have not understand who Mark is speaking to, which is the seven years to the world that comes first. And Luke is the pre-trib, the only one that goes first, and then has a 50-day period. When you see this, I promise you, it will open your mind, it will blow your mind, it will have you asking so many questions, and then you can go into the rest of the teachings in this intro series. The other place you can go to is... You can click right here to go to ministryrevealed.com. My computer is really slow, and I think it's because I have the website open, and that's where we're going to go next, so then we can close it out. But the other place you can go is ministryrevealed.com, which is our website right here, which hopefully won't take too long. Oh, thank you, Lord. To load back up, our brother Jimmy has made this the, the, the main landing picture again, which is great. We have the, the Ministry Revealed book. No, you don't have to pay for it. You can download it for free in PDF. And so you guys are aware, you see, you can go right here in the menu box. If you want, you can join us by coming in the forum. That's where, you know, Brian had posted and others post uh, over 1,200 people from around the world, like-minded brothers and sisters watching and praying diligently seeking. It's free. It takes you a few seconds to sign up. And when I was just talking about that intro series, uh, on the YouTube playlist, you can also come right here, click on intro, 
and watch the first the first four videos from the website as well. Now, I want to bring you guys to the book page. And the reason I want to bring you to the book page is because finally the book has been updated. I waited and waited and waited. And you see, one of the, the reasons was, uh, it's uh, you know, do I make the change, Lord? Do I make the change? Because the book, as prophecy, we understand that the end of days must have to be connected to the end of 70 years. Well, I believe wholeheartedly we have crystal clearly revealed the end of those 70 years, and we're in the 70th right now. When you understand a session and non a session, when you understand Leviticus chapter 19. And in the book, there was one place outside of the charts. So the charts have been changed, but outside of the charts, there was one place in the chapter on Daniel where I spoke about this uh, a partial understanding at the time of Leviticus 19 and that it would equal a specific year. So I went in, I made that correction. on In the book, it's page 90, 91, 92, and 93 are the only pages that have been updated with greater detail in the understanding, as just mentioned, of Leviticus uh, 19, 23 through 25, with the understanding also added about accession and non-accession. So you can come here, Click on the PDF in English and download it for free. Amazon, the if you decide you want a paperback, I don't know if there's enough time to get it, or if you want the ebook, they have been updated on Amazon. I know uh, Amazon US and Canada are for sure updated, which means I'm sure in all the other English ones, they're updated as well. The other thing you can do is click right here to read the book. And I want you guys to see where you can see it was updated, okay? So everything will be the same in the book, except on this page, on the inside, it'll say updated August 7th, 2024, and under copyright from 2021 when the book was written, this one you see right here, updated August 7th, 2024, okay? So if you see that, you'll understand when you go to the uh, page 90, uh, when it talks about Daniel chapter 9, and I explain about this, you'll see that that's where the things are different. And, of course, you will also see it um, when you go to the the charts at the back uh, that needed to, to be updated as well. All right? So with that, I am going to close this one out. And also let you guys know, um, so... If you, you see, I have uh, USBs. I download a bunch of USBs. I even bought some more. And I would recommend just a, a list of videos, you know, from the intro series, of course, and some other key videos, especially a lot of the recent ones, that you could download onto a USB. The other thing you want to do is download certain charts as well. So for me, I also have this chart downloaded onto all my USB. So I have the book because you can get it in PDF. You can download the book in PDF for free and you can keep it on all your USBs. So if people find it later, bang, they've got it there. I have some charts. I have this chart right here. I have this chart right here also printed. And I have this one right here. So this is that that complete that real the the detailed tribulation timeline with the bottom of the page right here some people also have it with this one um i just had it done on one page or, or on with page one but what i did is it was my wife's idea and the printer set it all up where it's uh on an 11 by 17 so it has all the timeline stuff and then it has these de these details under it as well so those are the three key ones, and you could also add this one as well. It has the little breakdown of it in a small little paragraph, and the reason I recommend this one is this is the one in the book that's updated as well. So this one here kind of lays it out in just a, a quick bird's eye view, if you will, and there are teachings that we have that show this chart as well. 
<laughs> so that's what I would download if I were you guys. The links are in the description box. This one is down there. Um, I believe, which one? So is this one. Uh, what's the other one? This one for sure is. And so is this one. If they're not, you can find them on the Ministry Revealed website as well. The other thing, I just got a text here just as I was about to start uh, from our brother Jimmy who takes care of our website. And people had asked, there was a question about whether we would, uh, for the website, whether we would be able to get the audio book version as well. And so Jimmy just found a place. Um, so he's going to spend the night downloading. The, we have like, I can't remember how many words the book has, 30-some thousand words. And so he can, he's got to download them and do the word conversions where the, the system will do it um, in chunks of 5,000 words at a time. So he's going to be spending the night doing that. So thank you very much, Jimmy. He said it looked like it was going to be awesome. So it was going to be a great reading uh, of the Ministry Revealed book. So again, that is a link that is on the website. Maybe give it another day or so and then go ahead maybe tomorrow night or something or Saturday. Go check it out and see that it has those changes and you could download uh, the audio book of it as well so you can have that for everybody. All right. So with that, let's get this puppy started it's it, it's it sounds crazy doesn't it it sounds wild to think that there's even this possibility that a group of people has has actually been revealed a mystery hidden in the word since the beginning of creation that the lord had had hidden from kings and and the angels and from all of these people but we've read before that the prophets knew that there was more in there but it wasn't for them to understand that kings have, des have, have desired to understand these things but it wasn't for them so it's not like this this was never even it's not even a thing you're just making this up no we've got it in scripture we know these things exist what's what's hard to wrap your mind around is that you're 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 part of this group where it's actually happening i didn't go looking for these things i didn't even know these things existed think of some of the revelations we've had like think of this one before the transfiguration to be able to understand the way the scriptures have been laid out in the story in whatever is written before the transfiguration of luke mark and matthew are the events and the insight of what comes before the pre, mid, and post, or just after that pre, mid, and post, in relation to the coming of the Lord after the wedding, to the coming of the Lord at the end of the six year seals, and to the coming of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives at the seven trumpets. It's it's incredible. And there's no way this this was never me. It's just this it's the spirit working through me. It's the spirit working in each of you to see it and to understand it. Do you know how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people around the world have been shared this information by you, by me, by others, and refused to even take the time to study any of it out to see if it makes sense? Just that simple playlist, those four videos, they couldn't even take the time. Why? Well, I understand now. Because it wasn't purposed for them. It's purposed for the eyes and ears and hearts to receive that were meant to receive it. And Elijah Company being prepared. That's what's going on. And you're going to see how, how incredibly definitive it is just in this beginning portion when when we talk about this this whole 14 or thing it's absolutely incredible so let's have a look right here let's start right here that was zion all right 14ers check this out many of you guys if you've been around for a while you've heard this but there's a group of people 
especially in America, but from around the world, that come to these mountains in America and climb these 14,000 plus peaks, which is why they're called 14ers. Now, when I started this ministry, when I started calling us 14ers, I had never heard of this in my life. I am not a hiker, believe you me, okay? I didn't know this existed, but they call themselves 14ers. What do 14ers do? What does it mean to climb a 14er? Uh, simply put, a 14er is any mountain that exceeds the evolution, the, the evolution, evolution of 14,000 feet. Do you think, knowing what you know in this ministry, at least if you've been around for a little bit, do you think that's just by chance? Why isn't there a group of people called tenthers or or twentythers or or fifteeners? It just so happened that there's a group of people who climb mountains called fourteeners. Well, what are they? They're mountaineers, right? They're mountain climbers. They are mountaineers. They are mountain climbers called fourteeners climbing elevations of fourteen thousand feet. And there's a group of them. They even have their own website, and they meet up at these places. They've got mugs and shirts and everything else. We, I had a sister send me a mug a few years ago. It was absolutely wild when, when this was shared with me. What are the chances? Well, it's the same in, in what Brian was talking about in this connection now taking place. Actually, I don't need that open. In relation to the last teaching, this mountain of the Lord that's coming, this mountain that these mountaineers, a group of 14ers in the revelation of 14 years, are being prepared, are being prepared in our, our, our understanding. It's so incredible to process this all and just to say, my goodness. Is this really happening? Well, I never made this up. I never made this up. Not only do they climb 14,000 feet, but we know what 14,000 means in the creation story. We'll get to that in a bit. How about this? Many of you guys will remember this. In Genesis chapter 11, remember, the end of days begins with 50 and then 14 years, but it's connected to the tail end of the 70th and then the 70th being over and it'll be the day and hour no one knows. Well, we know this. We've taught on it everywhere. The, the, it, it's so clear in so many places like Zechariah, especially in Psalms 90 and 10. Well, here's another one. In Genesis 11:26. Terah, who is Abraham, Nahor, and Haran's father, lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Why was this so exciting for us back in the day? Well, because this is like saying Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What do we know about all these groups? There is a portion in our focus here of the Luke group, a portion who go pre-trib to the third heaven, lowest room, and they're there in the presence of the Lord forever. But from among them, before this event happens, there's a group that is going to be remaining, girded about, lights burning, waiting for the Lord when he returns from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they will open unto him, and he is going to come and dine and serve them and eat with them. That's the wedding, that's the banquet after the wedding feast that we've shared on many times, and we'll touch on here tonight, but that we've shared on many times, and we showed just in a recent video how it takes place and, and what happened uh, uh, within it after the wedding. You know, after what? After the seven-day wedding. So we know within each group, another group then is chosen to serve. Seven years, then seven years, and then the millennial reign. Well, why was this so wild? Well, we know Abraham, right, for the Jews, right? Well, what do we know about Nahor? Well, what we know about Nahor is there's a group of people that are sleeping, right? 
everybody calls them the sleeping church those who may claim christ but they're not watching they're not seeking they're not really in prayer very often they're not diligently searching him out they're not waiting for his return they've got one foot left in the world or even a foot and a half or a foot and three quarters left in the world they believe in him but they would rather see their grand their grandchildren born and uh go on a holiday than than put more care into seeking the lord doesn't mean you can't look for those things or desire those things but they're just really caught up in those things and the world knows them as as the sleeping church well we know them as mark and nahor literally means snorer <laughs> it's it was so awesome when uh when uh mike from 165 interrupts 165 when they found this one it was so exciting it was just wild right well what about haran remember what we're talking about here we're still talking about this connection in relation to the mountain what do we know from a, a group of remnant workers what do we know about this group of remnant workers well those who are like the elijah's at the end those who didn't die but will be taken in the chariot right in those chariots what do we know about them? Well, they're going to the mountain of the Lord. So let's see what Haran's name is and understanding that we're also talking to a remnant group of people. So yes, this is the pre-trib Luke group, but it is also more specifically a remnant group from among them. This represents Mark's group, but there is a, a remnant, the 144 chosen from among them at the end of six years of seals. And then you've got Abraham's and you've got the portion of trumpets and then the tribes going out during the millennial reign. Okay? What is Haran? What is the definition of Haran? Check it out. Mountaineer. A mountaineer? So you mean in Luke's group, the one connected to it at the end of 70 years, who's a mountaineer, has a connection to 14ers and 14,000 being mountaineers in the Luke group, and this word for mountaineer comes from the hebrew word 2022 which means mountain which is range like or a range of hills do you know why this is a big deal do you know why this is such a big deal that it's connected to haran this remnant group from luke do you know why let me show you let me go to an easy place where we know a conversation about the mountain of the lord as we know from Zechariah chapter 8, this is now the beginning of trumpets. The mountain of the Lord is there, and they're going to start rebuilding the city and streets and temple. So here it is right here. Uh, Zechariah, we'll start in chapter 8, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy and was jealous for her with great fury. Well, do you know what happens when you go back to chapter 1? Watch this. We'll start in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years? What was it with, with Terah, their father? He was 70 years old, right? And here we are talking about the beginning of the 14 and 70 years. Here's another 70 years. And then you remember what he says. In verse 14, so the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And then being sore displeased with them, he brings forward the affliction. So what do we see? 70 years. And we also see where he is jealous. When we come to chapter eight, which is a prophetic picture of the beginning of the first year of trumpets, the mountain of the Lord is now established he no longer is jealous because the land had rested for seven years while they had been removed except as we know for the foundation being laid and now he is returned well what is he returned on verse 3 Zechariah 8 thus saith the Lord I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts the holy mountain 
Haran's name comes from the root word 2022, which is the same word as mountain in Scripture, but also the mountain of the Lord of hosts. Do you think that's just by coincidence? Do you think this is just chance happenings? Haran, 14 years, mountaineer, 14ers, mountain of the Lord, the root word, the name for Haran. A group of people for the last seven years, maybe about six or so years being called 14ers. Not with any understanding yet of any of these things. Well, it gets even crazier. Because a couple of years after the 14ers, who are mountaineers, we came to understand that the very early Christians, the first Christians on earth, were not called Christians. They were called, as you guys know, in the Greek, quadradecimen. Remember what that was all about? Have you heard of the quadradecimen? Understanding who these early believers were sheds light on this topic. Initially, the followers of Messiah referred to themselves as Nazarim, which eventually led to the term Nazarene, as we know it today. Interestingly, the Romans, who later adopted the label of Christian, initially termed these early followers as quadradecimen, meaning fort. You see how wild this is? Oh, you might think that that mountain connection in Haran, and when you understand the difference in the names, you might think, oh, just by chance. 14,000, 14,000 of days and years. <coughs> Excuse me, you might think it's just by chance, even though all the connections are there. Well, what are the chances? that the early Christians were called 14ers. This designation stemmed from their steadfast commitment to observing Passover on the 14th of Abib, calculated not from what he would say, full moon, new moon. This is, this is this guy's own belief, all right? It's not full moon, new moon. But from their belief, it came from the 14th day, which is true Passover. And these guys, the reason they did it was because of their commitment. They knew from the apostles. They knew the truth. They knew it was the 14th day of the first month. Okay? They observed the 14th day of the first month. And for this, because the world at that point started changing and started coming up with the Easter stuff, these guys said, nope, we don't care. What day of the week that Passover falls on? The 14th day of the first month is Passover. And, <clears throat> of course, then we went on to read about these early Christians called quadradecimen or 14ers, of which Polycarp was also a quadradecimen. Okay? Listen to what it says. The quadradecimen controversy arose because Christians in Jerusalem and Asia Minor observed Passover on the 14th of the first month Nisan, regardless of the day of the week on which it occurred. While the churches in and around Rome celebrated Easter on the Sunday following the full moon, sorry, following the first full moon, uh, uh, the vernal equinox, calling it the day of the resurrection of our Savior. The difference became an ecclesiastical controversy when the practice was condemned by snods and bishops. The background of it, of the disputes over the date of the Lord's Supper, should, sorry, of the disputes over the date of the Lord's Supper should be celebrated, disputes known as Passover or Easter controversies, the quadradecimen is the first recorded. In the mid-2nd century, let me show you this. You guys hadn't seen this before? In the mid-2nd century, so who was it? Smyrna. Hello. Those of you who have been around for at least a little bit, you know exactly who Smyrna were, is speaking to. It's this remnant group from Luke. So 
Look at what happens. In this time of the second century, this period that represented Smyrna. What do we have? The practice of in Asia, in Asia Minor was for the pre-Passover fast to end with the feast held on the 14th day of Nisan when the barley was ripe after the new moon near the Jewish lunar month of Nisan, no matter the day of the week on which it occurred. The date on which Paso the Passover sacrifice had been offered when the sem second temple stood, the day when people put away leaven. So what was all this about? Look at what it says. Those who observed this practice were called quadradecimen in Latin or fourteenthers because of holding their celebration on the 14th day of Nisan. This practice had also been held or followed by Polycarp, who was a disciple of Paul and Bishop of Smyrna. You see what they've done? They were called 14thers or 14ers because of their belief and their staunch standing on the truth of the 14th day of the first month regardless of what day of the week it fell on and they were persecuted for it they were crucified they were killed they were burned they would not submit to Rome and this observing on Easter Sunday and so people turned on them. We got a group of 14ers who were called 14ers climbing mountains 14,000 feet high who are called 14ers. Not a group of 15ers, not a group of 12ers, 13ers, no. Nope. A group of 14ers and another group of 14ers both directly connected to Scripture in 14 and being mountain climbers or mountaineers, one is 14,000, the other one is 14 as days. Well, isn't there a group that we know of, right? What happens in relation to prophecy? Prophecy, it's here's what it talks about in relation to days as years of prophecy. The day year principle or year for a day principle is a method of interpreting prophecy, Bible prophecy, in which the word day in prophecy is considered to be symbolic of an actual year of time. Hello. 14 days connected to Smyrna, the early church time, the one directly related to Smyrna that we've been teaching and preaching about here for years who are a group of people called 14ers but are we called 14ers because of days no nope. we're called 14ers because of the revelation of 14 years so if the original guys were called 14ers because their stand on the belief of 14 days and prophetically there is an end time group of Smyrna when the churches will replay again. And there's a group of people in the last previous seven years who have been prepared in the revelation of 14 years for the time of the prophetic end of days, which we're told a day can be a year in prophecy. And there's a group called 14ers, which had been unbeknownst to them as days to years. You want to know if there's a people being prepared, an Elijah company, a remnant group from Luke, and you're uncertain if, if, the, if this is all really true? How much more evidence do you need? It's, it, it's beyond wild. And it's given to us all throughout Scripture. It's all throughout Scripture. You guys will remember this, right? At least if you've been here for a little bit. What about 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8? Listen to what he says. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. I've always found that so harsh. It sounds really harsh, doesn't it? I think it's meant to be a little harsh. He's telling us not to be ignorant about this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Well, look at what follows. 
a comma and the word and. We've got a teaching on that, don't we? In fact, if you go to that intro series, if you're newer, you should watch that teaching called comma and. It's so powerful just from a revelation like this. A comma followed by the word and. Because it's not just a separation. It's a separation in addition to. And what did we understand from this? One day is with the Lord as 1,000 years. What did we come to understand from this? Well, we came to understand the exact same connection of the 14ers climbing 14,000 feet as the revelation of 14,000 years, with, of course, the mystery of the first seven, like we've been in preparing, being the gap theory of the first seven. Well, what do we get? What, what did it say from Genesis 1-3 when God said, let there be light? Most people don't clue into this, but this word for light is Jesus, exactly as John chapter 1 told us. John wasn't that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Which means the Father here made Jesus light. So what do we know about this time? It was called what? The first day. And then we've got the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth, sixth, and then the seventh day he rested. Well, hold on a second. If we go where we just were in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it said that one day is with the Lord. Okay? So if the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh were each called days, that means if it's one day with the Lord is as what? A thousand years. Which means that those days of creation to the Lord, they were all one day they were one day each for a total of seven days but if we were there as men in this dimension of time each one of those would have been as a thousand years we've proven this in scripture comma and which means separated but in addition to he didn't just reverse the wording so that you can really grasp it. It's comma and, meaning separate in addition to. 1,000 years as one day. Now, why did this become so important? Because when the days of creation were over, which were as a day to him, but would have been as a 1,000 to us, we then had what? Man created. Flesh was now created. And when flesh was created, what have we now begun? The thousand years. From Adam and Eve, or from Adam, we are now in this period of the thousands of years. Six thousand years, then it's over, and then you've got the one thousand years of the millennial reign. Hello? So what are we living in? We're in chapter 2 of from creation. We are living in the dimension of time of thousands of years. But what are they? What are each of these thousands to the Lord? As one day. Which means the first seven days of creation to the Lord were as a day. And the next 7,000 years, including the 7,000th of the millennial reign, to the Lord, they are also as seven days which means it's seven days and seven days. Hello. Which means 14 days total in the presence of the Lord to him. But to us, those seven days would have been 7,000 years, and we are currently existing in the 7,000 years of flesh. So it would have been 7,000 and 7,000 for a total of 14 days thousand now you start scratching your head and you start seeing this this connection to 14ers and them climbing mountains 14,000 feet and calling themselves 14ers just 
out of the blue randomly and, and choosing just that number of, of mountains to climb. Just And it just so happens the, the, the one of the brothers representing Luke is the mountaineer who goes up the mountain of the Lord. It's just, it's just all by chance in all of these things. Hello. Of course it's not by chance. And what is it to the Lord? Seven days and seven days. For what? A total of 14 days, just like the original unwavering first Christians were when they were being called 14thers not deviating from the truth of 14 days. Well, that's pretty wild, isn't it? Because you know what this reveals in the end of days, right? I'm sure you guys already understand it. Well, even if you're newer. Because if it's seven days to the Lord and seven days to the Lord, and the revelation is 7,000 years and 7,000 years, and there was a, 14 or day group of people and there's a 14,000 group of people and the original 14thers were 14 days and there's a group of Smyrna being prepared ahead of time to go out as this Elijah company to the end of seals and prophetically days are interpreted as years do you understand now do you understand the impact of thousands to years to days? It's the revelation. It is the revelation here at Ministry Revealed. Revealed in the Gospels. This was not found before the revelation of the Gospels. It was the revelation of the Gospels that revealed the 14 years. You still might think can is is there can you possibly imagine anything else when everybody comes against fourteen year teachings because they refuse to take the time to understand it? It's absolutely incredible. It has always blown my mind i always I love to talk about these these little stories these 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 historical and current things going back not only to Christ's time but going back even to the creation and showing this entire count it's all true there's not one little piece of this that's misunderstood and if it's all understood and we can see it in history we can see it current we can go all the way back to scripture we can understand it from from the the new testament back to the old and in all of creation then what do you think that means for a group of people over the last seven years being committed and understanding? Once they see it, they can't unsee it. Are you going to continue to stand on the 14 years as a 14er? I think you will. Because how can you not once you've understood it? How can you turn away from understanding Scripture so much more clearly than you ever have in your life? And turn from it. Because if you turn from the 14 years, you're also turning from your understanding of Scripture. Because that's what it reveals in the is to come. That brings clarity to the is and clarity to the was. Just like Ecclesiastes 1.9. What was shall be. Was is to come. And what is shall be. What is is to come. Old Testament, New Testament, both within them, the mysteries revealing the is to come. And a group of people have been revealed the revelation of 14 years. <clears throat> Welcome back to Ministry and Revealed. Newer, it and is hadn't seen this in relation to this conversation, this is the one that'll go into greater detail of what I just talked about of this fractal. I've spoken here about the 14 years as the days, the revelation to years at the end of days, and it being a bigger picture of the 14,000 years. But in that, in that, in the teaching about it's, it's all a fractal, you're going to come to realize there was another seven that came first. And this seven 
is the period of preparation of this group who are the spirit-filled group who are those in Christ spirit-filled they don't only represent this remnant group but they represent everybody alive who is in Christ spirit-filled who will take part in the pre-trib prior to everything beginning this is the revelation of the gap theory that shows it really was another seven days to the Lord or what would have been like 7,000 years if we were in the time dimension in the mystery of those first two verses. It's all about the spirit-filled portion. And from among them, the pre will go and a remnant from among them will remain and serve the Lord <clears throat> to the end of seals. All of this, <coughs> excuse me, all of this, I supercharge your business. Give me a second here. Let me finish this one. This with the all new Shopify point of sale, the all in one POS solution. All of this is a direct revelation that followed who the Gospels are speaking to. This is that 30 minute intro that came from the revelation that began, <coughs> excuse me, on September 8th, 2017. All of this, everything I've just been talking to you about, every part and piece of it is a direct connection to the revelation in the differences of the Synoptic Gospels and who they are speaking to. It's the whole picture. It's the big picture. It's the smaller picture. It's the medium picture. It's the entirety from the beginning of creation, of the very first creation, to the end of the millennial reign and the new beginning. Because the whole story is 20 two years of the end of days with the real stuff beginning 50 and then 14 years before the final jubilee but the true overall whole arching story is 21 seven, seven, seven. these are the last three sevens in the jubilee count of seven times seven years these are the final three this is that preparing of the bride of those who will be alive never having tasted of death before the seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And then the final jubilee represented as the 22nd year, which when the millennial reign is over, will be the 22nd thousandth year and the new creation with the new heavens and the new earth and eternity. Just like the Hebrew alphabet, 20 two letters what is the lord called the beginning and the end the alpha and the omega what is the beginning and what is the end it is the lord jesus christ himself and the count that brought about the revelation for the end of days began where in the alpha the beginning taurus at the beginning of creation just as it was in these seven years that are coming to an end that will end the true 70th year of Israel and the Jews being in the land. I know we're prepared, brothers and sisters. I believe we are as prepared as we humanly, spirit-filled possibly can in these final moments. I pray I have done everything I could, Lord, I have, I, I have shared everything I have understood as I understood it, as it grew, as it developed, as it revealed itself more. I know that each and everybody that listens, that seeks and searches it out, every one of you will be prepared. Whether we get to go to the lowest room or whether he has chosen us to remain and stay, which is highly more likely the case, we'll be ready. Because in either case, we will be 
in the presence of the creator of it all. I don't know how we will stand. I don't know if, you know, waiting for him when he returns from the wedding, I couldn't imagine the, 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 the number of heart attacks we would have waiting for him for that week. And then him being here and being in his presence at that banquet meal after the wedding for this remnant group that he will open up the understanding to, that will follow him for 40 days as the son of man, white horse rider. Man. I, 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 I don't we, how do we even fathom it? Teaching it is one thing. Revealing it and seeing it revealed and understood before our eyes. That's one thing. But then to have it be literally in our generation, the group prepared from, be, the, from before the foundation of the earth, for those that think, oh, that's just grandiose talk. You're going to see it. It's not my words. I'm just telling you things in advance, the things we've already shared and taught on. It's from the scriptures themselves. It's this group right here. Right? This is the revelation of 14 years. This is actually after the Gospels where it all began. When you have end time eyes, when the Spirit reveals to you the revelation, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 becomes clearly prophetic in what Paul was saying. These are the ones in Christ above, which is that 50 days, 14 years ago, because he's saying it is in going back to, as if being here, going back now to what it was like in the beginning. The first group is the one like a rapture, which is the word caught up, harpazo, to the third heaven. That's everybody going. From which a group of that Haran, the Luke group, will remain. Until the mid-trib, great multitude rapture, that goes to paradise, which is exactly what he's coming on at the great multitude rapture. Before the events of trumpets and then him returning to them, coming to them, feet down on the Mount of Olives the third time. It is a taking, a taking, and a return. Remember that Smyrna group we've been talking about? Remember what it says about them? Polycarp's connected to them, right? We saw even Polycarp is connected, who was the bishop of Smyrna, called a 14th -er himself. Those who put their necks on the line. Well, let's read a little bit about Smyrna. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things say it the first and last. Isn't that fascinating? I find this portion, we did a, a teaching on this not too long ago. It was incorporated into a teaching. These different sayings that are said in some of these churches and what it reveals. Here we are talking about the first and the last, the beginning and the end. A group from before the creation who will be here with them till the end of it. Because they're going to take part in the resurrection to rule and reign with them. They were, they were a group chosen from the beginning, from before the foundation of the earth. And they will be resurrected to rule with them until the end. And here we are, talking about the first and the last. Understanding from the beginning of creation to the end. And he calls Smyrna, the one who is speaking to them, the first and the last. The one which was dead and is alive. <laughs> why does why he say the first and the last which was dead and is alive because that's exactly the Smyrna group chosen before the foundation of the earth going to be resurrected having put their necks on the line and will be alive to rule and reign with them until the last, till it's over it's so incredibly telling when you understand these things I know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We know some of you 
is only found in Luke's discourse. We know the sum of you cast into prison is only found. I'm sorry, did I say Matthew? Is only found in Luke's discourse. And those cast into prison is only spoken of in Mar uh, Luke's discourse as well. And what is their reward? Not only is it the crown of life, but he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's important for us, isn't it? That's important for us. A group of people cast into prison, some of them being put to death, who will then be resurrected because they won't be hurt of the second death, which means they what? They take part in having been dead and being made alive, just like the first and the last. You know why? Well, because they're co-heirs. They're co-heirs. Christ has crowns. They receive a crown. They, they were killed with death. They will be resurrected, not hurt by the second death. They're going to be beat up and put in prison and killed just like Christ. They are the co-heirs. Who does this group <clears throat> represent in the, in the New Testament? We have them in Romans, right? We know this from this group in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, we've got, uh, as mentioned in, in just recent videos, there's a three-part series, like just over nine hours of breaking down the prophetic revelation within the gospel, I mean, within the book of Romans. It is all directed to those who are pre-trib, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, and the remnant that remain and will serve them. And it ends with this picture of them, this prophetic picture of them who are the Priscilla's and Aquila's. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. For, for, for the Jews in, in a seven-year tribulation? Nope. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Well, why is that? Why would it be putting down your necks during the time of the Gentiles? Because people have missed the point of Mark's gospel written to the world, the Gentiles, and the, that are grafted in to the house of Israel. It's the seven years of seals. And it's Priscilla and, Quil and Aquila who are that prophetic picture of those who will willingly put their necks on the line, who, by the way, are this same period of time having served the Lord, the same period of time. They are a prophetic picture of Smyrna, who are part of the first fruits of the wheat harvest that, that are chosen from among them to remain. That's who they are, putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. Well, what's the reward for those who put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles? Oh, well, we see it right here. Revelation to the thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. You mean like those who put their necks on the line? For the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, which means on, by the way. Um, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, so everybody else that died, outside of this specific group who put their necks on the line to serve the Lord during seals, but the rest of the dead, they didn't get to live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Why is it so important that this is the first resurrection? Because of what we just read. We, we see this group that's going to be the first and the last. We know that they're the first. This Smyrna group is the group that the Lord is going to meet 
just prior to he's going to let them know he's about to take the group to the to the wedding and to be ready when he returns it's the first group he's going to meet with and it'll be the last group resurrected made alive from the dead that will be with him till the end it's incredibly revealing and understood once you see it blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection here's how you know it was smyrna on such the second death has no power hello now you can also know who they are but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years so whoever put their necks on the line in the midst of seals to serve the lord having been chosen from the very beginning will be with them till the end will take part in having died and resurrected being what like christ i don't mean that they are christ okay but they are doing the lord's work suffering and enduring as he did and they will be taking part in the glory with the lord being part of the resurrection they're going to be glorified together as the lord was glorified this is the reward brothers and sisters for this remnant nahor group or, or haran group sorry this remnant smyrna group this polycarp group this 14er group I've said it many times. You don't teach your team and, and open the playbook and reveal to them and show them and teach them and prepare them in the playbook. And then when the big game comes, you close the book, send them all home, and bring on another team and say, here, learn this. As in heaven, so on earth. You prepare them ahead of time so that when the time comes, they're ready. And then the blanks get filled in. That's what's coming, brothers and sisters. So, who is this group also in relation to this resurrection? We know they're all the Smyrna group, right? We know this group very well. This is from that incredibly awesome piece of scripture i mean <laughs> you know i say that so often because it just and and i've said this often I, I i get giddy doing this because i love the lord i love that he has done such an incredible wonder in us to have given us these eyes to see these ears to hear and these hearts to receive this revelation that to almost 8 billion other people less a few thousand it seems like absurdity but to those given the eyes and ears and the heart to receive it is so crystal clear it's it's not even a kind of it's not a maybe it's an absolute revelation it is thus saith the lord understood it's not kind of it is the revelation it is a people prepared now we're just hoping and praying that the rest of this story that starts it has just as clearly been revealed and prepared and if that's the case this group that's first because of the contact they'll receive we will know it within three to four days. <laughs> it's wild. It's so wild. How could people know this? Incredible. We've, under, we've explained this wedding feast, the parable in Luke, why it's not in Mark and why Matthew has one. There's a Gentile bride, there's no Mark wedding, and then there's the Jewish bride at the end. We've talked on this many times. That anybody who has ever listened to these teachings where I talk about it, there is nobody from Ministry Revealed who should be found if they go pre-trib and aren't chosen to remain and serve the Lord, but that go pre-trib, 
there should not be one of them found sitting in the highest room at the wedding. We all know to sit in the lowest room for everybody going pre-trib to the wedding. And we see it right here from Luke 14, 8. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is the prophetic picture of the pre-trib escape going to the seven-day Gentile wedding of the old wheat, the winter wheat laotype connected to the true feast of weeks at the end of the true count of the seven Sabbaths, which is the eighth of Av. What happens after that wedding? There's a banquet. And at this banquet, it only occurs in Luke's gospel. Because this banquet is the representation of the banquet that the Lord has with that Smyrna remnant group when he returns from the wedding and has this great banquet with them, as you guys have all heard me teach on before. And what do we read about this banquet? Let's start, whoops. Let's start in verse, let's just go to verse 14. Actually, let's go 14, 15. In Luke chapter 14. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. Okay, you're bringing the, the blind, the maimed, the poor to the feast. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of of the just who is being resurrected at the end in this resurrection of the just the same smyrna group who we've seen and will show again and go into detail that are going to wait for the lord when he returns from the wedding they are the smyrna group and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Okay? Sat at meat with him. We know where that goes, right? So we see here, again, this, this connection to those who take part in the resurrection of the just. Related to the meal, the banquet meal that he has after the seven-day wedding. Well, what else do we know about this? This, this group taking part in the resurrection. I remember one of our older brothers, Jared, when he found this one. We shared on this many times over the years. We see it in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And of course, you guessed it, there are absolutely clear differences. And those differences are prophetic revelation. Every single time. Look at this. Even this one right here and are the children of God. Do you know this is only found in Luke's version? Do you know that this is only found in Luke's version and, and this in Luke's version? Listen to what it says. Listen to this parable, or this woman, and the, the marriages she had, right? So she had, married, she had been married seven times. Each husband died. She married again. And so they, they try to throw the Lord for a twist. And in Luke chapter 20, starting in 34, he says, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy. The term or the word deemed entirely worthy is used four times, but the specific accounted worthy is only used twice. 
What do we know about this group of accounted worthy? You guessed it. This group of accounted worthy, the only other place it's found is exactly where it should be. In the pre-trib verse of Luke 21, 36. Start in 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. You see? What if, what if you're not caught up in the things of the world and you're aware and you're diligently seeking and searching the Lord? Can you know what that day is? Sure looks like it. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The whole world is going to be caught off guard when this happens. Watch ye therefore, and here it is. This is the pre-trib verse. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This verse is telling you that this group will escape everything spoken about in the rest of Luke's discourse. And the reason for it is because the pre-trib happens at the beginning, at the end of the seventh Sabbath, right as the 50 days is about to start. Because the rest of this is about that 50, 40 day portion that remains. That's why they're told before they're going to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And who are the ones that escape it? The accounted worthy. And where do the accounted worthy go? Well, we know the pre-trib goes to the third heaven. They're going to the lowest room when they're bid into that wedding, right? Well, what do we know? What happened after the wedding? Well, after the wedding, he returns from the seven-day wedding, and he's going to have a banquet with a group who will be part of the resurrection of the just when they will receive their reward, which is what? The millennial reign with the Lord. Well, look at what the rest of Luke 20, verse 35 says. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. This is the pre-trib group. The Luke 21, 36. And then it says, comma, and. You see why I'm putting a, I was, I was being very purposeful when I spoke about it last. Comma and. That's what Jared, he caught this one. I don't catch them all. Jared caught that one. Comma and the resurrection of the dead. Who are the two groups from Luke? Those who are counted worthy? Going to the third heaven, the, the, the wedding? Sitting in the lowest room? And those who were chosen to remain to serve the Lord who will be part of the resurrection from the dead. Hello. There they both are again. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. And listen to this. And are the children of God. Being the children of the resurrection. Only Luke's in this in this story being given of Luke in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The children of God. This piece is also only found in Luke. It's all purposeful. It's all there for a reason. Who are these people? All right? We've shared on them before, right? We know who they are. Everybody going pre-trib is connected to Romans. And the discussion, as I've said, within it is not only the pre-trib, but those from among them chosen to remain. Those who are what? In Christ Jesus, spirit-filled. They walk not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. To this great piece of Scripture that I've shared many, many times, and I'm going to share again, because you're going to see this direct connection to who this is all talking about. From verse 14 in Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
they are the sons of God. We know how important that is, right? For those, if you were paying attention to what I was talking about in the big picture of the 14,000 years or the 21,000 big picture, the, the piece of the gap theory, which is Christ, the beginning, which is that picture of the 21 years to the Jubilee, the, the final year of the 22 in the big picture of the end of days. What came first? Christ, who is the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. So in Jesus, the beginning, God the Father created everything. That's right. The New Testament told us that Jesus created everything, and it was the Father that gave it all to him to create. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God moved during the portion of the Spirit, the Spirit group in the Spirit creation where there were the sons of God. Everybody knows that the Spirit portion, there were the sons of God first. You have to have sons of God before you can have sons of God that could fall. But remember, not all the sons of God fell. A third of them, right? Not all sons of God are the bad guys. You must always keep that in mind. A third of them fell. Verse 15, Romans 8. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of, you're going to want to remember this one, adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are, there it is, there it is. That we are the children of God. Do you know, as I said, only Luke's version has the children of God in it. In Romans, it's telling us who the children of God are. Those who are spirit-filled. Those who are accounted worthy and those who will be part of the resurrection of the dead. Those who put their necks on the line being spirit filled are the children of God. They all are, but they're the children of God chosen to remain. And what are they going to be? The children of the resurrection. Pretty wild how that all blends together, doesn't it? And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them. Now, of course, there is a, a daily uh, application of this in the is. For those that don't know what I mean, there's the was, the is, and the is to come. Creation to Christ, Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, pre-trib until the end of days are over. Was, is, and is to come. Of course, there's an application of this in the is because there's everybody still in Christ. But once the pre-trib happens, the only ones that are left are the ones in the is to come who are the Smyrna, those who will take part, putting their necks on the line to be resurrected, having what? Having suffered with them so that they could be what? So they'll be glorified together with them and their, re their reward will will be the resurrection where they will rule and reign with them for a thousand years as the sons of God and co-heirs with Christ. Do you understand why they're co-heirs with Christ? Because they're the ones reigning with them for a thousand years. It's exactly what we've read in Revelation chapter 3 at the end of Laodicea. It's the tail end of Laodicea where we are now right before it all happens and then the tail end of Laodicea, when the tribulation is over and the Lord has returned, feed them. It's the same group. And what are they going to do? Well, they're called the sons of God. They're part of the adoption, which means they're the Gentiles. And they're the children of God, co-heirs with Christ. They'll suffer with them and then be glorified together. This is all that Smyrna portion in the prophetic is to come. Every single part and piece of it. We see them, as you remember, 
many times when we've shared in this in relation to Luke chapter 12, as we really bring home what's been happening here, this preparation of a remnant group that will be chosen by the Lord to remain and serve him, a group prepared. That's what's going on. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Let your loins be girded about. You can remember that too. Every single one of these things is connected to this group. Every Everything I'm saying, remember this, it's going to be connected. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like men, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down at meat, and he will come forth and serve them. And then, of course, and if, she, and if he shall come in the second watch or third watch, so blessed are those servants. We know this is the end of seals. 144 is the second watch, and the third watch is related to the tribes that go out during the millennial reign. This is all about the first watch, Luke representation, Smyrna remnant group. Here's that Revelation 3 we were just talking about. In Revelation chapter 3, it's the end of Smyrna. The end of Smyrna. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. The end of Laodicea. We are in the Laodicean age. It's a period of Judah's kings, and who's in the land? Judah. It's not the house of Israel, it's the house of Judah. They're in the land. We're presently in the age of apostasy, the falling away. And it's going to be this right up unto the moment that the pre-trib is taken. At the moment the pre-trib is taken, the seven churches begin at the 50 days again in Ephesus. But what do we know happens in the moments before? I don't know if it's a couple days. I don't know if it's a couple hours or a couple minutes. But we know, we have shown here through Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, that there is one thing that is going to happen just shortly before the very end of the Laodicean age. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Right at the end of this Laodicean age, listen to what he says. Verse, Revelation 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Sound familiar? Darn right it does, right? It's exactly what he just told them in Luke chapter 12. In Luke 12. This group that he told to have their lights burning, to, their loins girded about. It's him warning them. Not only did we know this revelation right here, which we've known for a little while now. This is the Lord forewarning. It is a prophetic picture within this layer that is telling us that he will be letting a group of remnant in Christ, spirit-filled, Smyrna, Luke group remaining, that they're going to stay when he goes to take the rapture group to the wedding, the pre-trib group to the wedding. And he made it clearly known by revealing it to us right here in the last two verses of Laodicea as the very tail end of the Laodicean age comes, he is going to make it known to this group moments before it happens. You notice it's in Laodicea? It's in Laodicea? Proving that it has to happen right before Laodicea ends in the is? Because as soon as he takes that group to the wedding, the pre-trib, then it instantly kicks back. 
So what do you have right before Laodicea ends in this age? Him saying to be ready when I return from the wedding. That when I come and knock, you're ready. Of course it's there. It's exactly what Luke 12 said. Which means within three to four days, less than four days. Could you imagine? What is that going to look like? Is the Lord just going to come to us in a dream or a vision? To all those who are chosen to me, I have no idea. But I know that it comes at least moments or shortly before the pre-trib literally happens. We know who they were, right? They were the Luke 24 guys. It's the same picture as he tells them. You all know this. Only in Luke's gospel, in the resurrection story in Luke 24, do they constrain them, the two on the road to Emmaus. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, blessed it, break it, and gave it unto them. He only does that to the Luke group. So what he did in the is, is prophetically laid in to the is to come. And what happens? And their eyes were opened and they knew him. This is when he returns from the wedding. So what does that mean? I mean, we got, there'll be thousands of people scattered all over the world. Yeah, there will. But I believe he's going to translate them. Just like we see in scripture, like he did with, um, with Philip, with the eunuch. This group of people is about to be so empowered with, with not only understanding, but with the gifts of healing, resurrecting people from the dead, doing all sorts of things. All in the purpose of bringing people and revealing to them the truth and the power of Christ Jesus. So the fact that he's going to translate these people somewhere to have this meal isn't, isn't a, a concern. It's, it's just going to happen. And it happens when he comes after the seven days of the wedding are over on the eighth day. This group, as we know, will remain with them for the 40 days. And when the 40 days are over, the Lord is going to leave. I don't know if we if we see him go up. I don't know if he just vanishes. I have no idea. But at the end of 40 days, his warning as Jonah is over. His 40 days begin right here. Yes, the son of man is the white horse rider. Pre-trib happens. There's your seven days of the wedding and his coming on the eighth day. He will be here as the Son of Man, warning as he said he would as Jonah in Luke 11, and he will warn till the end of the 40 days. And this group will be with him, following him. Maybe he sends them out in the midst of these 40 days as well, and then gathers them back later. We don't know exactly how it plays out, but they are with him for 40 days, and he opens to them all of their understanding, which means what? He's going to complete the prophetic picture for them. When the 40 days are over, not many days later, three days later, while Jerusalem is being then compassed about, after Iran and those with Iran on the 9th of Av destroy or bring an attack and destroy much of Haifa and Tel Aviv. Isn't that amazing that they're declaring an attack on the 9th of Av right now and the Jews are fleeing in Israel? People are leaving Israel. There is no fly zone over Israel. And for the past over a week, Jews have been proclaiming there's an imminent disastrous attack coming. All exactly when it should happen at the end of the 70th year. This war, this attack, and this war will last for the seven days of the wedding and then will be settled down 
It will be a short Middle East attack, and the world won't want it to break out to World War III. And it will be settled because the Son of Man is returning the eighth day. He'll be here, as I said, till the end of 40 days, warning as Jonah. And then in the three days remaining, the raven spirit goes out. And for the next three days, Jerusalem is now being compassed about by Syria and Syria's proxies with them. And on the true Pentecost, when actual wine is harvested, on the 29th of Elul, this remnant group, this remnant group that remained and followed the Lord will then receive this filling, anointing, Holy Ghost, end of days pouring out upon them on the true Pentecost of what we've called Acts 2.0. And then what happens? You know what happens. We look to the rest of the story that he told them in Luke 24. While he was with them for the 40 days, and he said unto them, verse Luke 24, verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, check, in the prophets, check, and in the Psalms concerning me. Check. Now, do we know them all? Do we know every single detail of every prophetic revelation within them? No. Nope. But have we been prepared in them? Unequivocally, undeniably, absolute certainty, yes. Which means what? He's going to finish the opening of their understanding. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. All of this is only found in, you guessed it, Luke. There's a reason they're laid out the way they are. And so what does he go on to tell them? Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Exactly. Where are they going to be? They're going to be in Jerusalem. And after that anointing, do you know what they're doing? They're going out from Jerusalem. Because the compassing about that happened for not many days, then Syria and their proxies with them, having compassed Jerusalem, will attack and destroy Jerusalem. And the Jews will now all have been fleeing to the mountains massacres, some taken captive. Remember, there was a reason the Lord was here for 40 days, warning them to flee. Warning them to flee. What does Jesus call this group? Only in Luke. He calls them his witnesses. Who are the witnesses? They're represented as Moses and Elijah. We know there's a Moses arm of people, and we know there's an Elijah group. <coughs> Excuse me. And we've been teaching for a while now that I believe this group here is the portion of the Elijah group. They are the Elijah remnant about to be sent out. These are not the two witnesses of trumpets that people like to go into. These are not the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. These are the two witnesses of the portion of seals represented as the Smyrna workers going out, represented also in another typology of Leia, uh, uh, sorry, of Priscilla and Aquila, of Moses and Elijah's. We've covered this. We know this. They will go out from Jerusalem after their anointing. Remember back in Romans chapter 16. We've seen who they are. We know what they're doing. We know they're laying their, their necks down on the line. Well, remember this incredible revelation we've shared over the years? You can see it at the end of 
uh, uh, Romans, at the end of 1 Corinthians, at the end of 2 Corinthians. It's all about the pre and a remnant, the mid and a remnant, the post and a remnant. It was an incredible revelation from several years ago. Listen to how Romans chapter 16 ends. <laughs> James Mackin is is texting me like crazy. It's okay, brother. I'll get back to you in a bit. Listen to Romans 16 end in verse 25 and 26. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept since kept secret since the world began. Now, in the is, this was, of, Christ, of course, the coming of Christ. In the is to come, it's the revelation of the end, which was kept secret since the world began. You see, remember what we were talking about? A people prepared from before the foundations of the earth in the mysteries for the time of the end? It's the prophetic revelation, the end time eyes once they're opened. But now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What is this talking about? It's talking about the pre-trib having happened. The revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. You see, most people think they've understood the pre-trib. Well, they haven't because they always look at it in seven years. They look at it from Matthew. They don't understand the real mystery of what the pre-trib is. You can go to Revelation chapter 7 and people will call that the pre-trib. Really, it's the mid-trib. You see, the most obvious rapture in all of Scripture is the mid-trib. That's because it's the great multitude and isn't the mystery. The mystery is the pre-trib. And what's going to happen? It's going to be made manifest and be made known what? To all nations. Well, remember what happened in Luke 21, verse 34 and 35? That all that is about to take place, whoops, that all that is about to take place for those that were asleep, drunken in the cares of this world, what happened? That the whole earth would be caught off guard. All nations being caught off guard, will now understand this obedience of faith. It's not that all nations are going, oh, sure, there's people from all nations, but it's now going to be made known to all nations because of this group of people in the obedience of faith. Who are the ones that remained? Look who's not mentioned in this. There's no mention of Priscilla and Aquila because they've been chosen already to remain. This is the Priscilla and Aquila, the Smyrna group, who will remain to serve the churches of the Gentiles after the pre-trib has taken place. Look what happens when we go into 1 Peter. You'll see the same wording, the same connection and context that's taken place. Let's go into 1 Peter. All of it is so powerful. But let's start in verse 4 and read some of it to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, in the end of days. Clearly prophecy, wherein you rejoice greatly, uh, sorry, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many fold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ remember this is that pre-appearing for the remnant group whom having not seen you love in whom though now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. This is a description of all of you guys, of all of us. Receiving the end of your faith, 
and the salvation of your souls. Wow. How do you receive the end of your faith and the salvation of your souls? When you're in the presence at the appearing of Christ to this remnant group. Of which salvation the prophets, remember I told you this, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, were they seeking and searching the timing of when Christ came the first time? Yes. But remember what was shall be, what is shall be. So they weren't only seeking and searching the understanding of what it meant to Christ's first coming. They were seeking and searching this revelation of the end that they desired to also be a part of because they had understood some of these wild things that were coming. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Hello. The prophets, the angels. Wherefore, here it is, gird up your loins, right? Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ it's the same one as this appearing which is the pre appearing to this remnant group from Genesis uh, Revelation chapter 1 listen to this remember the word for obedience as obedient children as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance but as he which hath called you uh, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. This is what's coming, guys. All of this is connected to what's coming. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. Let's see more. Of what he's what he talks about with this group to whom coming as a living stone right Christ is the rock he is the living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious ye also as living stones remember that we did a great teaching on all this when you understand that this remnant group chosen to remain yes it applies to those who have take been taken pre-trib but also remember it's the portion of the remnant remaining being prepared now they are what the lord is the lamb they are little lambs the lord is the stone the rock we are little stones little rocks you see over and over and over again he is the light he is going to shine his light on them uh you are lively stone you are Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 8, and a stumbling stone and a rock of offense unto them which stumble at the word. You hear what that says? Even unto them which stumble at the word. Which means what? Which means there, there, there's people that are stumbling at it who study the word, who read the word and don't understand and are, that, are, that are stumbling in it. This isn't just anybody, some atheist unbeliever. <clears throat> it's those in the word. Why? Because they're disobedient. Hello. Being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. See, so see, people would get upset and saying they don't understand what this is saying. They don't understand. But they're, you know why? Because they end up getting caught up in too much of the things of the world. They're spending too much time in all these other things of the world instead of spending some set-apart uh, set time 
to pray and to seek and diligently seek the Lord. And because of it, they keep stumbling at the word because of what? They're being disobedient in other parts of their life. Verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You all know why that's so important, don't you? Isaiah chapter 9. You guessed it. I didn't even need to bring you here, right? Because we know exactly when this is and where it's connected, the timing of it, and who he's speaking to. Isaiah 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted, which means what? An attack with some destruction coming against the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, which is represented in modern day Haifa and Tel Aviv. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by way of the sea in Jordan in Galilee of the nations. This one, this afterward, is the one that comes on the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets, which is just as the history of the attack on the Feast of Trumpets by Ishmael from Jeremiah. Ishmael. What does Ishmael represent? Ishmael represents the raven. It's the Arab. It's represented by Syria. This light affliction, which will bring destruction to Haifa and Tel Aviv right after the pre-trib, when the 50 days begins. Haifa and Tel Aviv are attacked and to some extent very destroyed in that Middle East war that breaks out. At the end of the 50 days, Jerusalem is now attacked and destroyed as we see down here. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. And for all this, his anger is, uh, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Why? Because when you talk about an attack and destruction coming upon Israel and Jerusalem, and they're going to be removed from the land for seven years. Do you know how many people I've talked to that, that hadn't heard these teachings and understood the 14 years? Think you're an absolute lunatic when you tell them that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed when the tribulation begins and they will be removed from the land for seven years? Do you know how few people comprehend that? Because they haven't understood the revelation of 14 years, nor understood what Leviticus tells us about it. Leviticus tells us the punishment for disobedience. And it's, it's incredible what comes against them for this punishment of disobedience, which will be for seven times. Seven years for their disobedience. Why does seven years have to come against them? So that the land can rest. It literally tells you, because of their disobedience, and listen to what it says. Um, Leviticus 26, verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate, and ye in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. You know that's true, right? They don't, they don't allow the land to rest. They're not doing the things that they're supposed to do because they've erred. But that's okay because their blindness was for us, right? So it's okay. It was part of God's plan. So they're going to be removed from the land. But before the Syria attack at the Feast of Trumpets, the Lord is coming what? After the light affliction, after the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day, what does it say? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. <coughs> Excuse me. 
they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Why was this so impactful for us? Because we know Jesus' birthday is right here. Third month. Third month. In the midst of the third month. But when Jesus fulfilled from the prophecy of the was and fulfilled the is in Matthew chapter 4, he did not fulfill it on his birthday, though the wording sounded like it. Because John was now cast in prison when Jesus fulfilled it. And we know John baptized Jesus at his birthday. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, came back from the wilderness, chose his disciples, started baptizing. And John was still there with his guys. And then John was taken into, into prison. It was about two months later when Jesus literally fulfilled it. So what do we have? From 15th, 16th day of the third month brings you to when the Lord would come on the 15th to 16th day of the fifth month. Exactly what? After the seven-day wedding, the attack by Iran and their proxies on Haifa and Tel Aviv and the short Middle East war breaking out after the pre-trib happens and the Lord coming on the eighth day, exactly two months after, just like the scriptures said he would. Those that have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Who is this royal priesthood, this remnant group remaining to serve the Lord who are waiting for him when he returns and knocks? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Pretty wild, right? What if we continue? In 1 Peter chapter 4, one more sip of coffee. 1 Peter chapter 4. Listen to this. Beloved, let me see. Uh, yeah, that's where I want to start. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Hello. <laughs> Isn't this what we were just reading about in Romans chapter 8? This, this fiery trial, because they're going to suffer as Christ did so that they can be glorified as he was. Because remember what happens. We saw in, uh, 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 in um, Revelation chapter 3, at the end of the Laodicean age, he warns them that he's going to be returning from the wedding. And then at the end of the end of days, Laodicean age, we see what their reward is. So let's see what it says. So, uh, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That rings a bell, right? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. All right. What did it say about these guys? The ones that are spirit filled, sons of God, part of the adoption. Right. What does it say about them? They're going to be co-heirs with Christ, right? Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If we suffer with them. That they'll be glorified together. That's the same conversation happening with this group. Don't don't find it strange that you're going to be going through these things. You might have powers and abilities in these end of days. Incredible abilities to to reveal the power of Christ in you to those that will be coming to accept Christ. But the fiery trial that you're going to be experiencing, don't think of it as something strange. Because if it happened to Christ, it's going to happen to you. Because you're going to be partaking in his sufferings to bring in his people as he did for them when he did it. You see? That when this glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Okay? You may be glad with exceeding joy. If 
you be reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are you for the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began with, at us, what shall be what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, there where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Be ready, guys. As partakers, we will take part, obviously, in the fiery trial that's coming so that we can take part in the glory with Christ. And we know that. And in fact, maybe I'll jump to that right now in Revelation 3 at the end of Laodicea. Remember, verse 20 is what takes place just prior to the pre-trib and the very end of the is of the Laodicean age. But then, at the end of the is to come Laodicean age, it will end with verse 21. And what is it in verse 21? To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. You understand what the reward is? This is something that is beyond comprehensible. We can read it. We can understand what we're reading. But to understand that what you're going to be doing for the Lord is as the Lord did. As he is the stone, you are the little stone. Only he did what nobody could do, which is salvation, which is the death and resurrection to free us from sin and the bondage of this world. And as these little mini hymns, we can't do that, but we can go and bring that story and his power and his authority everywhere we go in this time that's coming, in the years to come. And for that, as little stones, as little lambs, we will take part in the things he takes part of. Try to wrap your mind around that. You're going to be resurrected from the dead. Before the resurrection from the dead, let's do this in order. You're going to be in his presence, having a meal with him where he's going to be serving you, breaking bread and giving you some. You're going to be following him for 40 days as he has revealed to you the rest of the story of the revelation of the is to come. And you're going to have power and authority. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you greater than it did in the original Acts. You're going to be able to raise people from the dead. You're going to be able to hide people. Just There'll be mysterious events and people won't be able to see you. So people are being protected, being brought to places. You're going to be able to heal people by speaking a word. You will be killed. Most likely, many of us would be killed. But then take part in the resurrection in the end as he was resurrected. And then sit with him in his throne at the end. As when he was resurrected, he gets to sit on his throne. And then he will then move with his father into his throne and we sit with him in his throne during the millennial reign, ruling and reigning with him. Come on. <laughs> I know I teach it. I know I understand it. I know we can connect all of these dots from the beginning of creation to the end. We can see the evidence of it everywhere, revealing the exact same picture all the way through the books of the Bible. But seriously, we're to try to wrap our mind around that. It, it, it uh, how? I think that's a great way. You, you simply can't really wrap your mind around it. 
and the ability to not really wrap your mind around what all this will entail and what is all coming, not being really able to picture it and to comprehend it is a great thing. Because I think that's part of humility. You can imagine some people, if this was in the wrong hands and some others knew it, outside of you guys, maybe some others that are very boastful and proud people, you know, yeah, we're going to be doing this, and, and we can see it. We're going to be sitting there on the throne with the Lord, and they can picture themselves. There's a reason certain people were chosen and others weren't. It's wild stuff. It's crazy, wild, fascinating. As we start to bring this to a close, how about this one? How about in Ephesians chapter 1? I think I'm in chapter 1, yep. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Told you I wasn't saying it. Remember, I was talking about this at the beginning. I, I, I wasn't just the one making these words up. I was just repeating what I knew was in Scripture. What do we know about this group of people? Well, let's have a listen and see if it connects to everything else we've been talking about. As he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Well, there's only one group before the foundation of the world, and it's all those that are spirit-filled in Christ. Hello. Remember when the Spirit of God went out, the gap theory, G Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2? To Romans chapter 8, the sons of God, who have the Spirit of God? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto, here it is, the adoption of children. Now, that doesn't get any more clear, does it? Remember that? The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit, Romans 8, 16, that we are the children of God. Hello. And we're what? Through the spirit of adoption. I mean, it, it's all right there. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In whom we have, listen to this, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, is this to everybody? Yeah, it's, it's connected to everybody pre-trip. But this specific conversation is the mystery of the end of days to the remnant portion who's remaining. Let me prove it to you with this word redemption. This word redemption, let's go into Ecclesiastes 1.4. Oops. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, sorry, verse 7. Um, in whom we have redemption through the blood, okay? Look at this word for redemption. It's the Greek word 629. Whoa, remember that? This, the teaching I'm doing right now is 628. It just reminded me. If the Lord prompts me, the Spirit leads me in that wedding week, as if we're to remain, and I'm to do another teaching, it would be, remember, it would be the 629th teaching. Do you know where this word is used in all of the discourses in the Gospels? This is, as we have shown, speaking prophetically to the end days remnant Elijah company, this Smyrna group, this Luke remnant, as we've been saying the whole time, who will have their redemption when the Lord returns. They're going to be taking, they're going to be doing these things. Their time will begin having received the redemption at the coming of the Lord. This word redemption which would be my 629th video, according to the list on YouTube, in the midst of that week, 
if I was to do one, is the exact same place where you only find it in Luke chapter 21 at the coming of the Lord when he comes to begin his 40 days. Verse 27, Luke 21. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, which means on a cloud with power and great glory. Who's going to see him? Not the whole world. This is him coming. At the end of the seven-day wedding, he's coming on the eighth day. He's coming as the white horse rider. And who's going to remember? Who's going to recognize him? His remnant. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. G629 draws nigh. It's the coming of the Lord to ransom this remnant group, to give them the understanding, the revelation, the power, and the authority prior to everything else they'll receive in the Holy Ghost of what we call Acts 2.0. Back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You see, is this all over the world, wisdom and prudence in the Lord? No. It's just like Paul. It's like these guys, it, they're speaking in their portion of time about this group that's with them. Hoping to reach more. Having made known unto us, listen to this, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Is the mystery made known to everybody? No. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Get ready, brothers and sisters. This is a group of people on the earth. This is a group of people on the earth. So as we bring this to a close, what do we know this people does? Well, remember, if Romans was to the pre and the remnant that, that remained to serve, and Corinthians is like to the Mark group to the end of seals, and 2 Corinthians is to trumpets and to the end of trumpets and those who go out in the millennial reign, his third, when he returns, the third time, but this time feet down. If Romans 13, uh, 16 was the remnant workers of Priscilla and Aquila, those who will put their necks on the line for the Gentiles during seals, the Smyrna group, that, that remnant of Luke, and the pre-trib group is gone in the mystery of the revelation. Look what happens. When we get to second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You're going to be able to understand this conversation going on. Let's start in verse 4. Because who's talking? It's a picture of the remnant group speaking to a group of people in the prophetic end of days during the time of seals. They're speaking to the Mark group. Those who were left behind, who weren't prepared, the sleeping church. Starting in verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not in the wisdom of the world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Remember the mysteries? He didn't make it known to everybody. 
they would have twisted him, they would have taken him, they would have hidden him. He saved it for a group of people, and this group is this prophetic picture and what Paul's saying as this time of Mark's group during seals. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom, see, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto glory. You see, that the people of this world, they, they, it wasn't for them. It wasn't for them to be understood. We've received it from a group that the Lord had ordained before the world even began. Which, listen to this, here's the answer. Which none of the princes of this world knew. You see? Not only in the is, but the prophetic, in the end time revelation of the is to come. It wasn't made known to them. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You see, this encouraging word, this strengthening word, knowing that what is going to be taught, what is going to be preached and prepared for them, it is Christ crucified in the resurrection. But the rest of what this people will know, chosen from before the beginning of the earth, with the revelation of it from the beginning of the world. I and ear had not heard, then understood. And what is coming that's going to be prepared for them? They haven't understood the pre, which will already be gone, the mid to paradise. This is like a group of people talking in the is to come. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Remember what happens, right? At the Acts 2.0. This pouring out of the Holy Ghost, which means these guys having it are the ones now gone out as Smyrna, gone out during this time of seals, speaking to those left behind. Um, but the Spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see that? Who are the ones that are going to receive the Spirit of God, that in full indwelling of the spirit of Acts 2.0. The same ones that were freely given the revelation from God of what's coming in seals, just like Luke 24. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdoms teaches. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches but that which the Holy Ghost teaches. Hello. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Can you see your preparation? It's, it's like we're speaking. It's like a, a group of us being represented, speaking here to, to the church, to, this, to the left behind. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You understand why so many people don't want to hear? Imagine the awakening during the time of seals with the revelation of the complete understanding and the power of the authority in Christ, spirit-filled to the max of Acts 2.0. They'll start to listen now. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the, man, the mind of the Lord, that he 
may instruct them, but we have the mind of Christ. Who has the mind of Christ? Those who are of the Spirit of God, who are what? The sons of God. Who are what? Co-heirs with Christ. Being, being taught by the Holy Ghost, who revealed them and, and completed the revelation and the power and authority at Acts 2.0. What's coming is beyond anything we can imagine. Beyond anything we can imagine. And their work will go to the end of the revelation of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let me prove it to you. Now you see the collection of the saints. The prophetic revelation here is literally, excuse me, the collection, the coming for the great multitude rapture. And he's going to see those who have letters written good about them, like the 144, who are going to be the ones who will become the next first fruits. They are the 144. They are going to be the next first fruits that are going to work during the time of trumpets. We've taught on this before. Well, now look at how the prophetic picture in here ends in the imagery of the end of seals. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The church of Asia, of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Well, that's, that's from Romans chapter 16. So we saw in Romans chapter 16, them as a picture of the workers, a Smyrna, the workers during seals. And at the end of Romans 16, we saw the picture of another group that was the mystery kept secret for the obedience and faith, they were the ones that left pre-trib. Smyrna, Priscilla, and Aquila remained to work during the picture of seals, having received the understanding of the Lord, being those who were from the found before the foundation of the earth, having been predestined, who will take part, having put their necks on the line in the resurrection of the just with the Lord. And here they are now, prophetically, at the end of seals, and now it's them with the church that is in their house. It's a prophetic picture of now the rapture group and the Smyrna group coming to an end. The two on the road to Emmaus, Priscilla and Aquila, Moses, Elijah. It's the whole prophetic picture. And then what comes? Well, it's exactly as we know it, right? From Mark chapter 9 from mark chapter 9 which brings us to the end of the six days days as years the end of the six years of seals what comes before the end of the sixth year of seals revelation chapter 6 the very end the last couple verses of revelation chapter 6 that's from the that video that teaching right of before the transfiguration. The reason why Mark has one verse is because this represents the coming of the Lord with the kingdom of God, with power where they will have seen it come when he comes with heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain connected to the name of who? The Priscilla's and Aquila's, the, the Moses and Elijah's. Specifically here, that Elijah company who are referenced as 14ers, mountaineers, the revelation of the 14,000, 14 days, 14 years of the end of days, who will see this coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And then, at the end of the six years, on the day of an hour no one knows, there's the Lord. Starting after six days, which is day one of the seventh year, the day and hour no one knows. And what do they ask about, which they never asked about in Luke's? You guessed it. Mark 9, verse 11. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. And how it is written that the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you, Elijah is indeed come and they have done unto him 
whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. And when he came to his disciples, listen to this, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. Why? Because this is the prophetic picture of the coming rapture, the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. After what? After the Elijah company had been here and did restore all things. You see, when we go to Malachi chapter 4, we clearly know it, have understood it, and have taught it. Behold, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, the Elijah company, right? There probably is a specific Elijah, but there is a company of Elijahs with him. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. When is this coming and dreadful day of the Lord? Day of the Lord? Exactly. Revelation chapter 6. When they're crying in verse 15 for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. Verse 16 says, And said unto the mountain and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? This here is Mark 9, 1. It is when the Lord comes and he says in Mark 9 that Elijah has indeed already come and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed. He did restore all people. When does this Elijah prophet, this, this Elijah company, when are they going to do it? Clearly, unequivocally, it has to be during the time of seals. Before what? The coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. When he shall have what? When he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Just as we've shown and taught in the discourses. Because when the Lord comes for his 40 days, his preaching, his teaching, his warning, what he will be doing will bring division in houses, three against one, two, uh, three against two, two against three, father against son, mother against daughter, in-law against in-law, until the time of seals and the Elijah company restores them all together. And then what happens to the beloved Elijah and that Elijah company of the end of days. Remember, the John the Baptist died. Elijah never died. The Elijah of the end of days, I believe that portion, they may not be the ones who die. But the Moses portion, as Aaron and Moses both died and couldn't be taken into the promised land, and John the Baptist did. We know there are two portions, and it tells us some shall be put to death. What do we know about Elijah? Well, let's finish it off right here. We know that Elijah is directly related in 2 Kings to the coming, as we recently taught in the seven churches, to the coming of the Lord directly related to Sardis as the seventh year of seals right here. The exact period of the conversation we're having in Mark chapter 9, which is after the sixth year. So the Lord comes at the very tail end of Thyatira, just as we showed when he comes with the rod to rule and reign. And Sardis is that seventh year. And what is it also? Second Kings. It's when he begins to reign as the king of Israel. And he is what? It represents the time of 2 Kings. And as you guys recall, 2 Kings is directly connected in 2 Kings chapter 2 to when Elijah, never having tasted of death, was taken away in a chariot of fire for which what we revealed in that last video, that last teaching, the incredible revelation of what an upper 
millstone looks like and is, my brothers and sisters. Those of the Elijah company who will not taste of death at the coming of the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals, having restored father and son, mother and daughter, in-law and in-law, will be alive at the coming of the Lord, and they will be taken in chariots, quote-unquote, of fire as revealed in the last teaching, the powerful revelation of what's coming when the Lord comes with Mount Zion, which is paradise, the place prepared, and who is taken in a chariot of fire but the Elijah company. Why was this so powerful? Why was this so connected to what we were teaching and getting at today? Why did our brother make the comment about the connection to it being so powerful now? Because we're 14ers. We're 14ers. We represent the, the, the Harans. We represent the mountaineers. We represent those serving during seals for the Lord. As the mountaineers who will go up the mountain of the Lord as the mountain of the Lord comes, a group of mountaineers will be taken in upper millstones to be with the Lord in their portion, never having tasted of death. Brothers and sisters, I hope we're ready. I believe in my heart of hearts, I have done everything I could have done to reach as many as I could have in the sense of doing teachings online. By doing this online, the Spirit can lead anybody the Father chooses to say that one. And I have absolutely no say over any of it except to do my job except to do my calling which was the revelation of the open books and the is to come and to prepare a modern group of 14ers in the revelation of the end of days to serve the Lord and ready a people brothers and sisters as I said in the beginning, I love you. I am so forever eternally grateful. And now more than ever, I cannot wait to meet you and yours, whether in the third heaven at the beginning or at the end of it, or whether we remain to stay and serve the Lord as it clearly appears to be. Having received the revelation, not through dreams, not through visions, not through thus saith the Lord's, but through the Spirit-led revelation leading it all. And the evidence is the mysteries of in the teachings that have tied it all together, having been revealed from the beginning of creation to the end of the millennial reign. It is all true. And having been all true, and I believe not only having understood the day as I do the Gospels in the 14 years, I also believe we have proven the 70th year for which it all begins. And the only thing left is August 12th, the last day of the 8th of Av. Brothers and sisters, I love you again. God bless you. God bless your families, and I so look forward to meeting you in his presence here or there, eating at the wedding or eating at the banquet after. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God strengthen you. God keep you and be with you always. 
I love you. Bye for now.